So I'm the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and it is my great pleasure to be running the uh, core, uh, the Core Connections lecture series for this semester, and this both of the talks that have been this semester are on the very first theme of the core curriculum: environmental awareness. Our first speaker was Dr. Brad Singer from Wisconsin, who talked about a super eruption in the Andes, and what we were interested in was was getting both, you know, this time getting two scientists. Uh, and how they looked at different environmental disasters. You know, uh, he looked at one that was going to happen at just one exact point. Dr. Premack uh, today here from Boston University is talking about climate change. And we were particularly excited about this because this is not going to be the typical scientist's talk. This is going to be where he's going to be using some very interesting data to look at climate change. But I would like to tell you a little bit about Dr. Primack. He got his uh, bachelor's degree at Harvard University, and then he got his PhD at Duke. And he has had a very interesting career where he's been a postdoc at in New Zealand. He has been at the University of Hong Kong. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo. All, all throughout most of that time, he's also been a professor at Boston University in biology. And I will leave the rest of it to Dr. Primack to talk to you about detecting the effects of climate change on Thoreau's Concord. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my first visit to the University of New England, and I compliment you on your choice of universities with such a spectacular view and uh, wonderful place to be. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is research which I've been doing over the last 12 years on the effects of climate change on the plants and animals of, of Massachusetts. Um, sometimes I'll be using the first person, the word I, in my talk, but this is really a, a project which has been done by many graduate students at Boston University, lots of undergraduates who have helped along on the project, and many colleagues at other universities. Uh, this project, uh, which I'm going to talk to you about, about the effects of climate change on plants and animals, really began 12 years ago when I was working on the latest edition of my textbook, which some of you are using at this university, uh, Essentials of Conservation Biology and the Shorter Version of Primer of Conservation Biology. So 12 years ago, when I was working on a new edition, I was uh, struck by the fact that all of the examples of climate change were from faraway places. So I was talking in my textbook about polar bears in northern Alaska and Canada. I was talking about wildflowers and their distribution in the Swiss Alps, frogs in the mountains of Costa Rica. And there were no examples from anywhere in New England and only two very small examples from anywhere in the eastern United States. And 12 years ago, if you can remember back to that time, we had President Bush as our president, and he was very skeptical of climate change, said it was just a theory, that we didn't have to do anything about it because it was just a theory. And the American public was not convinced of the need to take any action about the effects of climate change. And so what I decided to do was to see if I could see the effects of climate change in Massachusetts, because it seemed to me that if climate change was really a global phenomenon, that you didn't have to go to northern Alaska to see the effects of climate change. It should be readily available, readily uh, observable anywhere that you were in the whole world, and including places like Boston or Massachusetts. And so I decided if I, could, if I would look for these kinds of examples, and then also to convey this information, whatever I found, to the American public in, in as wide a, a fashion as possible. So this talk today is really a description about what myself and my colleagues and students have found in our 12 years of searching for evidence of the effects of climate change uh, in the Massachusetts area. Uh, let's see. So it turns out that if you're going to look for the effects of climate change in the United States, that you could probably, we could probably not have chosen a better place than Boston. So we were incredibly lucky to have 
started this investigation in the city of Boston because the city of Boston has extraordinarily variable weather, but the weather is getting warmer. So this is a graph showing the temperature, the average temperature in the months of March and April. So these are the months that we selected because these are the months of, in spring, and you have a lot of biological activity which take place in the spring. And this shows the average temperature in the months of March and April from the 1850s through the present time. And the reason I'm showing the 1850s is, as you'll see later, that this is the time when Henry David Thoreau was very active when he was uh, investigating uh, the material um, in Concord, writing about Walden and other phenomena in the Concord area in the 1850s. And you can see that in Thoreau's time in the 1850s, the weather was very variable, but on average it was about 2 degrees centigrade. So that's about um, 36 degrees Fahrenheit on average in the months of February and March. And over the course of time, even though the weather is extraordinarily variable, you can see that the temperature is getting warmer. So we go toward increasing warmer temperatures um, over these um, 160 years. Uh, I'd also like to point out that um, in 2000, so I have a pointer here, point out with the pointer. So in 2010, we had the warmest spring ever recorded in the Boston area. So 2010 was kind of off the charts. We thought we would never see a year like that ever again because it was so unusual. And then 2012 comes along and then it's similarly kind of off the charts warm, not only in the spring but really through the whole year. So we have these two record-breaking warm years one after another. Uh, I'd also like to point out we had another, there was another naturalist besides Thoreau that was very active in Concord um, right around the turn of the century, around 1900. And the weather was already getting warmer at that point. So we have Thoreau's time, which was very cold. This other naturalist whose name is Hosmer, where conditions were getting somewhat warmer. But again, very variable weather, but toward warming temperatures. So this two degrees centigrade warming temperatures, or about four degrees Fahrenheit, um, is the warming which is associated with large cities. So Boston is a great place to study the effects of climate change because it's had more warming than the rest of the country. And two-thirds of this warming are caused by the urban heat island effect, the warming associated with clearing of forests and having paved roads and buildings and parking lots. And one-third of that is or about 0.7 degrees centigrade is due to the warming of global phenomenon, the global, the, the global climate change phenomenon. And so the rest of the country has already experienced about 0.7 degrees centigrade. That's probably what you've had here in Biddeford. But by the end of this century, the rest of the entire United States and the, and the globe will experience about 2 degrees centigrade warming temperatures. That means that Boston has already experienced as much warming caused by both global warming and urbanization as the rest of the country will experience by the end of the century. So that means that studies of, in places like Boston, New York, Chicago, represent very good model systems for studying the future effects of climate change on the rest of the country. So even though that wasn't our intention initially, we basically lucked out. We chose a system which, was really, which has had dramatic warming and which was more likely to show biological effects. So we had three basic questions that we quite consciously set out when we started our project in 2003. And the first question is sort of what is happening? To what extent can we go out and see the biological effects of climate change um, in Massachusetts or in New England? The second question is sort of why should we care about it? Now I think a lot of you are environmental studies uh, students or faculty. And I think that probably I don't have to tell you, but just we'll review briefly that the reason that we should care is that we keep putting more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And it's very conclusively demonstrated and accepted by the vast majority of scientists that these gases that we're putting into the atmosphere are causing the warming temperatures which are being experienced all over the world and which are causing not only the atmosphere to warm, but the ocean to warm. It's causing the melting of glaciers, the melting of polar ice caps. Uh, it's causing the warming of, this, of these estuaries that you have just right outside your door here. And this is causing enormous biological effects. It's causing the distribution of plants and animals to change. It's causing a lot of endangered species to decline in abundance and are th is threatening them with extinction.
But it also has huge consequences to people also. It can mean the collapse of agriculture, the death of forests as insect pests become more common. It can cause sea level rise, which can flood forests. And it caused the increasing spreading of tropical diseases. So even though the warming temperature might seem appealing in a place like Bitterford, Maine in the middle of the winter, in fact it has terrible consequences, economic consequences, social consequences to the United States and the entire world. And then the third question is, what are we going to do about it? And as conservation biologists, we're concerned not only with documenting the threats to biological diversity, but also trying to develop some constructive way of dealing with the problem. And so in our case, our goal is really to publicize whatever results we find, to make the public aware of the reality of climate change, uh, but also eventually the changing opinions of the American public and the government will result in some changes in policy to actually deal with the threats of climate change. And this might include things like just adjusting to the warming temperatures, but also eventually reducing our production of, of greenhouse gases. So as biologists, we were interested in studying three potential impacts of warming temperatures. One is the impact of climate change on phenology. And phenology is the timing of biological events. So when plants flower in the spring, when birds arrive. The second is the distribution of species. So as looking to see how warming temperatures might affect the northern movement of, of animals or the movement of animals up mountains, or in the case of estuaries like this, sort of the, the movement of fishes or um, lobsters or other creatures which live in, in the ocean or estuaries. And then also the changing abundance of species. Warming temperatures is going to suit some species and harm others. So we expect warming temperatures will create winners and losers. And can we see the effects of that at all in our environment? So our approach beginning a dozen years ago was to see if we could find old records. So beginning in 2002 and then onward up into the present time, we're always looking for old records of phenology, abundance, and distribution. And in the Boston area, we have so many records like these because we have little small societies, little bird clubs and insect clubs and uh, mushroom clubs. And so myself and my students would go to all these clubs and ask people if they had any old records of when things were happening or the abundance of species. We would write, uh, myself and particularly one graduate student, Abe Miller Rushing and I would write, we would write notices for newspapers and newsletters. We would uh, put notices on listservs. Uh, we would ask anybody that we knew if they had old records. Um, and we actually, at one point, we went around and started putting up notices in supermarkets and libraries and town halls, asking people if they had old records. And after a while, people started to send us old records or tell us about old records that they had. Then we found that there was really a wealth of records. Um, so I think in the Portland area, for example, you would probably have a lot of old records here because Portland is, is an old city uh, with a lot of educated people. And there will be records there if you go looking for them. Maybe not as many as in the Boston area, but there are often old records in places where there are universities, um, natural history societies, or uh, urban areas. So we found that there were a lot of records. And of all of the records that we found, the ones which were the most spectacular, the oldest, um, and uh, really the most complete, were the ones which were established by Henry David Thoreau in the 1850s. So Thoreau was at Walden Pond in the 1840s, but in, the, in 1851, he started keeping very detailed records about when plants were flowering in the Concord area. Um, so, and we started to use these. Uh, the great thing about working with Thoreau is that he's very well known, of course, for writing the book Walden about the importance of self-sufficiency, which is still read by American students today. But Thoreau is also very quotable. So it's always something to learn by, by reading Thoreau's quotes. So Thoreau said, I want to go away soon and live away by the pond. But my friends ask what I will do when I get there. Will it not be employment enough to watch the progress of the seasons? So for those of you uh, uh, University of New England students who are living out by the point in those beautiful houses by the ocean, you know, just start looking about what's happening around your house and record when the, the plants are flowering and uh, when you see birds in the spring, coming in the spring or leaving in the autumn, what the ocean is doing. And over the course of 
you know, your time here, you'll have a great record about what was happening over the course of the seasons. And this is what Thoreau did. He recorded in great detail when plants were flowering, uh, when more than 300 plant species first flowered um, in the spring in the 1850s in Concord. So only in Concord, not only within the political boundaries of Concord, and not even to, uh, one foot across the line in the surrounding towns. This, by the way, is a statue of Thoreau, a replica of Thoreau, which is just in front of the uh, a reconstruction of his cabin on the edge of Walden Pond. So several months after we began looking for records, we were told that Thoreau had kept these very detailed records. We got in touch with an independent Thoreau scholar who, who has copies of everything that Thoreau ever wrote in its original form. And a couple of days later, he sent us Thoreau's uh, tables that he made up of flowering times. So Thoreau recorded his original observations in his journals, and then in the late 1850s he began to extract all of his observations into tables. And Thoreau had, uh, is well known to have had really terrible handwriting. He started off using common names, and then he switched over to scientific names. His common names and scientific names are often different from our modern names. So it actually took us several years to decipher his handwriting and then actually match his names with our modern names. And so, for example, you see right here, this is like, you have to read this and know that this is S. Alba. So this is his writing. And S. Alba, we now know, is Spirea Alba. So he was also even abbreviating things. So it was a real challenge to figure out what his names are. But eventually we matched 99% of his names with the modern names of the species. So again, he had this series of years from 1851 through 1858. And again, Thoreau is very quotable. Thoreau says, one has as much as he can do to observe how flowers successively unfold. So Thoreau was actually walking around Concord for four hours a day, um, every spring during uh, every, every year of his life, and recording again when plants were flowering in the spring. So we had Thoreau's records from the 1850s. There was this other naturalist named Hosmer who made observations in the late 19th century. Um, and then beginning in 2003, Abe Miller Rushing and I began to make observations in Concord for the same wildflower species like Rhodora, which is a, a type of azalea, and the bird's foot violet. And we started off making observations on all 300 species, but eventually we realized that we should focus on spring wildflowers because they're the most responsive to climate change, or they seem to be very responsive to temperature. And also, we focused on species which were very common in Thoreau's time, very common in Hosmer's time, and also are still very common today. So these were species that were very easy to find um, and that were, f were fairly similar in, in their abundance during these three time periods. And so this was our activity in the spring of wandering around Concord, Massachusetts, looking for wildflowers. Uh, I should also mention to this audience that we actually had lots of undergraduate assistants, and they really liked this activity, as opposed to what professors often make them do of sitting in laboratories, <laughs> typing things into computers, or uh, washing glassware. These students got to wander around Concord in the spring, looking for wildflowers, and then eating ice cream afterwards. <laughs> So this is a, uh, a summary of our results, and I always sort of pause when I see this because uh, this represents so much work to make this graph. This graph represents just years and years of work just to make one simple graph which tells the story of what we found. So on the x-axis here we have the, the years from uh, 1851 to the present time. On the y-axis here we have the dates in the spring. So very late spring, very early spring. And each one of these symbols here represents the average flowering time of 32 common wildflower species that Thoreau, Hosmer, and we saw in every year of observation. And then this horizontal line here represents the average of the averages. So these are all of Thoreau's years, these sort of uh, blue diamonds. Uh, so a lot of variation from kind of late May through early May, but on average the plants are flowering around May 14th in Thoreau's years. And if you go to Concord today, you know, it seems 
pretty idyllic. It doesn't seem to have changed very much. This Walden Pond is still there. The Concord River is still there. It's a very forested landscape. It looks very idyllic. But by Hosmer's time, about 40 years later, the plants were already changing their flowering time. So a lot of variation in terms of when plants flower, but plants are now flowering about May 10th. And then if you look at our years, right here, so our years are shown as these red triangles, and you can see there's a lot of variation. So these are very late years, and then these are, are extremely early years, but on average the plants are flowering around May 4th. So about a 10-day shift in flowering time from Thoreau's time to the present time. So even though Concord looks like it hasn't changed, in fact, the plants are now flowering about 10 days earlier. And then we had 2010 come along, and 2010 was an extraordinarily warm year, and the plants just flowered off the charts early. And again, I thought I would never see a year like that ever again, that I thought this was just a very unusual weather year. And then in 2012 comes along, and again, the plants are flowering kind of off the charts early. So these plants are flowering more than three weeks earlier than in Thoreau's time. So just an unbelievably early <coughs> flowering time. And so when these results came out, when we, we published our results, our goal was not just simply to publish our research in journals that nobody reads the way most scientists do. Our goal was to try to reach as wide an audience as possible. So we did publish our results in a peer-reviewed journal, but we also wrote a press release describing our results, which Boston University issued. And we also contacted every journalist and scientific writer that we could think of to tell them about our research. And so this story was covered very widely. It was in the New York Times, the Boston Globe. It was on National Public Radio. It was on Canada Public, public uh, Radio. It was in you know, European newspapers. And it, it reached a very wide audience because it told the story of climate change and linked it to Thoreau and Walden. And so it was also you know, very easy for people to appreciate that climate change you know, was a reality even in places like Concord. When we did our research, we were also interested in determining you know, what was really the factor driving these changes. And so in addition to seeing changes over time, we also did analysis to see whether it was temperature or some other factor which caused these changes in the flowering time. And instead of doing the analysis this way, you look at how temperature is affecting the flowering time, you find a very high degree of correlation. So you find that it's really temperature in the spring, temperature in, in the months of March and April, which are really driving this change. That plants flower really early in warm years, and they flower really late in cold years. And the reason that we have earlier flowering now than in Thoreau's time is because the temperature is about two degrees centigrade warmer on average than in Thoreau's time. And we're always looking for new ways to tell the story of climate change and to reach a different audience. And uh, at the Arnold Arboretum in the Boston area, uh, it's a botanical garden. Uh, it's one of the oldest botanical gardens in the United States. But they've just started to keep records of when plants flower at the Arnold Arboretum. But we were interested to see whether there was any way in which we could determine when plants were flowering in the past at the Arnold Arboretum to see whether climate change was affecting the flowering time. And at the Arnold Arboretum, they actually have a herbarium, a museum of dried, flattened herbarium specimens. And we realized, after working, making observations about when plants are presently flowering there, that we could match our present flowering records with these herbarium specimens to see about the change in flowering time. So these herbarium specimens are almost all collected when the plants are in absolute peak flowering time. And this herbarium specimen of Vasiae's azalea was collected on May 19th, 1938. And what we did is we matched hundreds of these herbarium specimens of past peak flowering with when the same individual plants are flowering on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum today. So this photograph was taken on May 3rd, 2010. And by, again, matching all these records of present flowering with past flowering time, we can again demonstrate that plants are flowering 10 days to two weeks earlier now than they were in the past. So this photograph, again, was taken you know, two weeks, where the plant is in full flower, and this photograph is taken 
two weeks earlier when the plant was in peak flower based on these herbarium specimens. The other thing I, which I want to mention is that one of the things that we do in our research is that we're very interested in reaching the public with the message of climate change. And so this photograph is a very carefully designed photograph. So we actually chose the most beautiful plant at the Arnold Arboretum to take this photograph. And we thought a lot about how to kind of pose the picture. Do so we actually have a thousand versions of this, of this photograph, <laughs> you know, with just different people and different kinds of signs that they're holding and different lighting conditions. And this is the one that we like the best. And this picture has actually been used in a lot of newspapers so that when journalists talk to us about climate change, we can give them photographs like this, which they can use in, our, in their stories, and this makes them much more willing to write about our research because we can provide them with nice media like this. And most scientists don't think like this. Most scientists, if you tell them the need to take photographs to document their work and to tell the story, they think that that's cheating or that's like unethical, that it's something that scientists shouldn't be doing. But I think that that's very important for scientists to reach the public with the story of science and, and new developments in science. And you do that through telling stories and having material like this to share with them. So we're also very interested in uh, the effects of climate change on animals. And we found that there was a lot of information about birds, about when birds were arriving in the spring, migratory birds. And we addressed two basic questions using the data we were able to find in Massachusetts about bird arrival in the spring. So the first question is that are birds responding to climate change? Are they coming earlier now than they did in the past? And is their response similar to plants? So we know that plants have changed by about two weeks to 14, by about 10 days to two weeks, and are birds changing the same amount? So this right here shows a, um, a bird in a mist net at the Manomet Bird Observatory. So since I know a lot of you are taking ornithology, um, so how many people can recognize this bird? Raise your hand if you know what bird this is. <laughs> so raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand if you know what bird this is. I want to see some undergraduates. Dave, Dave, what? Dave knows. Okay, what bird is it? Um, well, I'm not actually wearing like glasses, but it looks like a um, catcher. Okay, that's not correct. <laughs> yes. A cat bird. Okay, that's a cat bird. Great. Okay, great. Okay. I thought these are students taking ornithology here, I, but okay. But of course, it's upside down and it's twisted in a net, so it's, it doesn't look like it usually looks. Okay, does anybody recognize that bird on the right? <laughs> Raise your hand if you know what it is. Okay, so people do know some birds. Okay, people know the wood duck more than they do the cat bird. Okay, so. It turns out that, that if you're looking for data on the effects of climate change on birds, there are some spectacular examples. So this is a record for when you see, when a, there's actually a, a woman who lives in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and in her farmhouse, there's a big window in her farmhouse that overlooks a pond, and this woman writes down when she sees the first wood duck in the spring. And she's been doing this since 1970. And and as you can see that in, the, in the, 19, the early 1970s, the wood ducks were mostly appearing on her pond in the month of April. But by, uh, the, ninth, by, the, by the, the early part of this century, the wood ducks were arriving in kind of early March or even late February. So there was about a four to six week shift in the arrival date of the wood ducks on her pond. And this was actually really a measure of when the pond melted, because wood ducks actually arrive early and are hiding in the forest, and they just show up on the pond when it melts. So she was seeing the wood ducks early, but also the pond was melting earlier. So this is a very dramatic example of the effects of climate change. And, but the results, it turns out, are really quite inconsistent, that, um, that we find that there's a huge amount of bird data and that some birds are arriving earlier, but a lot of birds are not arriving earlier. They're just, they're not changing at all. And some birds are in fact arriving even a little bit later now than they were in the past for certain statistical reasons or sampling issues. So we find that there's a lot of data. Some of it is from Concord, Massachusetts. So Thoreau was also observing uh, bird migration times um, in Concord and other people have continued his observations. So a lot of different data sets, at least four that we've analyzed so far. And what these data sets mostly show is that birds are arriving 
probably a couple of days earlier now than they did in the past. So they're responding to climate change, arriving earlier in warm years and later in cold years, but not responding as rapidly as plants are. Um, so that's kind of, kind of you know, a, a major difference. And that birds are really responding to a much more complex set of cues. So birds are also responding to things like wind direction. So they mostly are flying north when the, when the wind is coming from the south. They don't fly in rainy weather. So birds are responding to climate change, but that's, the temperature is only part of what's causing them to migrate. And so we don't see as clear a single with them as we do with the plants. And what we're really actively investigating now is, is insects, because insects are the connecting link between birds and plants. When the birds arrive in the spring, they're feeding on insects, and when the insects emerge, they're feeding on the plants. So a lot of our research effort in the, la in the last couple of years has been trying to find insect data. So what we find is there's a great abundance of information which you can find about plants, a great amount of information available which you can analyze on birds, but insect data is extremely difficult to find. That there are very few historical records about insects and very few modern records about, about insects. But after years of searching and asking every person we could think of, we eventually found that there was a source of butterfly data which we could analyze gathered by the Massachusetts Butterfly Club. And of all the butterflies, the ones that we thought were the most interesting to analyze were the elfins and another group which are called the hair streaks. So these are little butterflies which appear in great abundance in the spring, in the case of elfins, in the summer, in the case of the hair streaks, and then they die after a couple of weeks. So we thought that they might be a good indicator, and it turns out that they are also very responsive to temperature. So they come out very early in warm years and very late in cold years, and so they're responding the same way that the plants do. Just after we started our work, a study was published about bees in New England, again showing that bees are very responsive to temperature. And so we, at least we know with these two groups, the butterflies and the bees, that they are similar, performing similar to what the plants are doing. And so it seems that the birds are really the kind of the odd group out. And so there's the possibility that when the birds are arriving, they're arriving a little bit late after the peak, the first peak of insects in the spring, and that they may not be having enough food to feed their nestlings later on in the spring. So this is a possibility of what is called a, an ecological mismatch. And this is something which researchers are, are investigating right now to see whether, in fact, birds are doing badly because they're no longer matched up to the life cycle of the plants and the insects. So this is just a summary of, of what I've sort of described so far. So one of the, the similar types of currencies that we can use to express what's happening with plants and insects and birds is how responsive species are to temperature. So this is the, would be the case along the line here, the zero line would be the case if these groups were not responding to temperature at all. And what we see, the uniform currency that we can express our results in is that plants flower about three days earlier for every one degree warming of temperature. And we've experienced about two degrees of warming already in the case of the Boston area, which means that plants are flowering about six days or, or a week earlier now than in the past. And this is about what the bees are doing and it's about what the butterfly is doing. We're also doing some studies now on leafing out times of trees. We're finding the trees are in fact seem to be more responsive than, flowering t than the flowering times of plants, that they're leafing out even uh, more strongly in relationship to temperature, but the birds are kind of doing something differently. They're not responding as much to temperature. And for those Thoreau scholars among the group, Thoreau often w wrote about things in a very um, kind of, a, kind of an astonishing uh, predictive way or, or kind of a, just showed great insights in terms of how the natural world worked. And so Thoreau in 1852 wrote, insects and the smaller animals follow vegetation. The greater or less abundance of food determines migrations. If the buds are deceived and suffer from frost, then are the birds. So Thoreau was writing about kind of an interaction between, between birds and insects and plants and how it was affected by weather. And so he was already thinking about, about climatic variation and how it would affect these three different trophic levels of an ecosystem.
And in his time, people were mostly thinking about how cold affected natural systems. Presently, we're thinking more about how heat affects natural systems. But he was already thinking about, about these kinds of climate change interactions with ecosystems already 160 years ago in a way which was just incredibly perceptive. And so I think if, if Thoreau was alive today, he would probably be a climate change biologist. So one of the things which happens when you go out and you look at natural systems is that you often discover something that you didn't initially anticipate. And in our case, what we discovered when we went out looking for the flowering times of plants in Concord was that so many of the wildflower species that Thoreau observed and wrote about, we couldn't find. And so after three years of field work, we deliberately started going around searching for the missing wildflowers of Concord that Thoreau wrote about and other botanists wrote about and we couldn't find. And eventually, after several years of, of intense searching, we concluded that about 27% of the wildflower species that Thoreau and other botanists saw in Concord at that time are no longer occur in Concord. About 36% of the wildflower species which he saw are now rare, meaning that they occur in very small populations and only a few populations. As an example, this purple fringed orchid was common in Thoreau's time and we only saw one plant in one year. So it's become extremely rare. Most of the species seem to have occurred in the last 40 to 50 years, and we know this because a lot of the older residents of Concord tell us that they've seen these plants in Concord, but we can't find them anymore. We can't find them even in the places where they saw them. Certain groups of plant species are especially vulnerable to ex local extinction. I should say all these extinctions are local extinctions within Concord. These species occur elsewhere in Massachusetts or New England. So, Example is orchids. There were 21 species of orchids in Concord during Thoreau's time, and we're only able to find seven of them. So orchids, lilies, mints in particular have declined disproportionately in Concord. And a lot of these losses are due to things like increased deer populations, air pollution, water pollution, habitat destruction. But at least some of these losses are due to climate change. And we know this because it's a lot of the northern cold-loving species, which are the ones that are declining in Concord, and the southern warm-loving species in Concord are the ones which are increasing. We also have a big increase in invasive species as well in, in Concord. So what's happening, we think, is that, that, in, that the climate of Massachusetts is gradually changing. So the, the climate of Massachusetts is gradually taking on the characteristics of climates further to the south of us. So it's as if Massachusetts climate was actually migrating further to the south. So this is the, what the climate of Massachusetts was like before. The Massachusetts climate 30 years ago, which is what the Massachusetts climate was then, but Massachusetts now has a climate like Connecticut used to have 30 years ago. And if we look at this, this is a climate change projection as to what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change thinks the world climate will be like by the end of the century, and kind of in an average scenario that the, that the world's climate and the Massachusetts climate and the Maine climate will be about two degrees centigrade warmer than it presently is. And in one possible scenario, a higher emission scenario, which actually we're on track to achieve, we may have as much as a three degree centigrade warming in temperature. And so if we just have this kind of mid-level projection, by the end of the century, Massachusetts will have a, a temperature which is two degrees centigrade warmer than presently, and we'll have a climate like Washington, D.C. Or for example, you know, in Maine, you'll have a climate like you know, southern Connecticut, or maybe you'll have a climate like New Jersey by the end of the century. So you'll have a climate here like New Jersey presently has, which is something interesting to think about. You'll be like New Jersey. <laughs> So, but one possibility is that Massachusetts might have a climate like southern North Carolina. And so, for those of you who've been to the Carolinas, you know it's, it's dramatically hotter than it is around here. And that's what Massachusetts could be like by the end of the century. So, an example is the Venus flytrap. The Venus flytrap occurs on the coastal plain of North Carolina and it only occurs in this one small place. 
if we want to try to protect this endangered species, the Venus flytrap, we can no longer think about protecting it in North Carolina because by the end of the century, North Carolina is going to be too hot and too dry for the Venus flytrap. And so if we want to protect the Venus flytrap, we have to protect it in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts will have the climate like North Carolina by the end of this century. And so it represents a very different way of thinking about conservation. Thinking about conservation not only protecting, where, protecting species and ecosystems where they presently are, but where they'll be like in coming decades and by the end of the century. And so this leads to a subject which is being very actively discussed in the conservation community called assisted migration, where we help species to move to track climate change because they can't move fast enough on their own. So if we don't do anything, the Venus flytrap is going to go extinct in the wild where it presently occurs. But if we start moving it, we could potentially establish new populations of it in Massachusetts by the end of this century. So this is really kind of a summary of all the work which we've done to date, but we have a few new directions in our research. One is that we are interested in the whole biology of leafing out. So climate change researchers have tended not to study leafing out times, but this is a very active area of research now, which we're doing and a lot of other people are doing. So we're actually documenting the variability in leafing out time across all uh, vascular plants. And so actually at the Arnold Arboretum, we're recording the, the leafing out time in the spring of over 1,200 species of plants and linking up with botanical gardens all around the world to document the variability among different species in terms of when they leaf out in the spring. Uh, we're also kind of thinking about this from a historical perspective. So this is a picture taken at Minuteman National Historical Site in Concord. This picture was taken on uh, April 18th, 2012. And it shows you that the trees were leafing out on April 18th, 2012, when the Battle of Lexington, or, or you know, on the anniversary of the Battle of Lexington and Concord during the Revolutionary War. But this is actually nothing like it would have been during the Revolutionary War because the trees would never have been flowering and leafing out on in the middle of April during that time. That during the time of the Revolutionary War, the trees would not have started flowering or leafing out until late April or probably the beginning of May. So it just shows you that our historical perspective may be changed because of this sort of changing uh, seasons which we're experiencing because of climate change. Another interest is looking at how uh, different species respond to the warming climate. And this is just a, a group of twigs that I picked up in Newton, Massachusetts uh, one day in April of 2011. And on this day, as I walked around, it was very clear in the woods that it was non-native invasive species like this honeysuckle or Japanese barberry or the multiflora rose, which were leafing out really early in the spring. And the native species, which are shown here, like beech, maple, uh, witch hazel, were not yet leafing out. So part of the reason that species are very successful as invasive species is that they're able to respond to the warming climate much more effectively than our, than our native species. We've also been carrying out experiments to determine the experimental basis of how species respond to climate change. And you can do this very easily by cutting twigs all during the winter and then seeing which species are able to leaf out right away when you bring them into the warming temperatures of the laboratory and which species are like conservative New Englanders and they have to go through the warm winter, I mean the, the long cold winter before they can respond uh, to spring warming. And what we've seen from our experiments is that if you take in twigs during the middle of the winter, what you find is that most of the native tree species of New England, like the elm, the oak, the ash, that they don't respond to warming temperatures. They just have to keep sleeping like conservative New Englanders and not acknowledge the warm temperatures. But if you look at the invasive species, so like buckthorn, uh, uh, winged euonymus, bittersweet, and this one right here, which is Japanese uh, barberry, that you just bring them into the laboratory in the middle of the winter and they immediately leaf out. So as soon as they're exposed to warm temperatures, they immediately leaf out and respond to this warming temperatures. And the shrubs, the native shrub species are somewhat in between. And then what this tells us is the climate continues to warm 
that it's really the, these non-native invasive species which are really going to be able to take advantage of the change in climate much more so than our native species. And then another large new area of research for our group is looking at autumn phenomenon that the great majority of climate change researchers really focus on the spring. Spring is when things are changing very rapidly and it's really temperature which, are, which is driving the changes. But the autumn is a neglected season in climate change research. One could also probably say the same about the winter. Um, and so we're, we're really emphasizing the autumn in our research at present time and we're looking at how climate change is affecting the length of the growing season, when how long trees keep their leaves, when birds migrate in the spring, and when insects go to sleep in the autumn. And so this is really what our focus is at the present time. So again, we return to Thoreau, and Thoreau says, we cannot see anything until we are possessed with the idea of it, take it into our heads, and then we can hardly see anything else. So you can really apply this to anything, whether it's kind of, you know, French poetry or modern architecture or whatever it is that you get an interest and in, you just get very fixed on it. And Thoreau was very fixed on nature and through this research over the last 12 years I've become extremely fixed on the idea of climate change and looking for the effects of climate change um, in Concord and um, throughout New England and that as I walk through Concord today at places like the Estabrook Woods, Minuteman National Historical Site, or Walden Pond. I mean, I see Thoreau everywhere, and I see climate change everywhere. And as you, you know, as you go around any place in the United States, you can really see the effects of climate change if you start looking for it, and you can identify with Thoreau's statement here. So a few concluding remarks here, a few com com concluding summary statements that when we began our study 12 years ago, there was no evidence for the effects of climate change anywhere in New England. And we now know that spring is certainly happening earlier in New England as a result of warming temperature. Uh, there's lots of data out there once you start looking for it. And I bet any one of you, if you went to Portland and started looking around, you would find something in Portland that you could use to investigate the effects of climate change in Portland or other areas of Maine. More changes are coming. So uh, we're starting to see a lot of changes in the Boston area because of urbanization, but there will be changes coming throughout the rest of the country because the conditions are getting warmer year by year. Um, for those of you who are you know, going to be here for the rest of your lives or for a long time, or wherever you settle, if you, if, particularly for those of you who are younger, start keeping a diary because within your lifetime, you're going to see enormous changes. So record when things flower, when they leaf out, when birds come in the spring. Uh, another thing is that we think that interactions are probably changing. We think that the interactions between birds and insects or plants are probably changing, but we really don't know at the present time. It's a very speculative topic. Uh, in my talk, I really emphasize climate change, but there are lots of other things that are changing also, like more deer, pop, more deer uh, habitat destruction, air pollution, acid rain. So there are a lot of things which are changing, but I tend to emphasize climate change. There's a lot of potential for research in other areas. So for example, insects is a great, there, there are insect data sets out there. We need more work on insects, more work on leafing out. Uh, particularly, there's a great opportunity for studying how species respond genetically to climate change. More research is needed on invasive species. There's a lot of topics which need further research um, on climate change. I, I think that we need to start thinking about management. So as the climate warms, it's going to be affecting a lot of our protected areas, a lot of our endangered species, and we need to think about how we're going to manage these systems as the climate continues to change. And I'm a great believer that we need to start potentially thinking about moving species in response to climate change. So if species are not very good at migrating, like the Venus flytrap, we need to think about actually moving them in response to climate change because the climate is changing so rapidly that these species can't respond on their own and they're going to go extinct if we don't do anything about it. The last thing that I want to mention is that the public needs to be informed and involved in climate change. And all of you have a responsibility as, as educated people, as people who know about climate change, who are learning about it in your courses or teaching about it, that you know, we need to reach out to the public because the public is so 
misinformed about climate change. There's a lot of, of misinformation out there. The public is also uh, distracted by other things. So it's distracted by, by economic activities, by economic problems. It's distracted by things like healthcare issues, by wars in places like Afghanistan. And the American public and the government is not focused on climate change as an immediate priority. And this is something that we really need to be involved with as educated people and as scientists, that this is something that we really have a responsibility at, on and something where we can really make a difference. So maybe at this point, I'll stop and, and see if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> yes? Um, just to play devil's advocate, if some species can't respond to climate change, um, then why should we help move them? Um, why not let natural selection happen? Well, natural selection isn't going to happen because these species are going to go extinct before natural selection will have any chance to kind of affect them. But I think really what you mean is why shouldn't we let nature take its course? Why shouldn't we just let this process play out? And I think that the answer is because we're the ones who created this problem. So we're the ones who we're the species, people are the ones who cause the climate to change, and hundreds or thousands of species may go extinct because they can't respond rap to this, they can't respond rapidly enough to migrate in response to climate change. And so, because of our actions, thousands of species will go extinct, and more species will not be evolving for millions of years to take their place. And I think that if we take you know, some responsibility and move them that at least they have a chance of surviving. So that would be my, my response. I mean, if you were really tough, you know, if you were really Darwinian, you would say, well, okay, just let them die out. But, you know, I think that if, if you, you know, make a mess, it's your responsibility to clean it up. Yes? Um, I was wondering, what does, is there any detriment or other significance to the plants when they bloom early, or is it just an indication that it's warmer? Um, well, plants, plants are, and they're responding to the warming temperature, so plants have mechanisms to detect the spring, and if, if it's warmer earlier, then they wind up flowering earlier. Um, so there are consequences, I mean, it extends the growing season, so potentially the plants will have a longer growing season, they could grow better. Uh, if they have fruit, then their fruits will mature earlier and, and the seeds will disperse earlier. But the negative consequences of that around here um, in Maine in particular, but also in Massachusetts, is that you have, can have a warm spell, the plants start flowering and leafing out earlier, and then the jet stream dips south, and you have a series of, of nights that are below freezing, and then it kills, kills the young leaves and the flowers and the young fruits, and then the plant actually does much worse. And particularly for plants that can't re-sprout very readily, then they really, their whole growing season is really disrupted. Um, the plants don't, don't set fruit. This plays really a lot of havoc with growers around here. So with things like apple crops or other fruit trees, blueberry bushes, if they, flower, if they start flowering and leafing out really early and then there's a frost, it just kills the flower buds and the young fruits and there's no crop that year. Yes? Uh, did Thoreau in his um, observations of warming at Walden Pond notice like physical changes in the pond, like it getting smaller, or if he went fishing in it, uh, decreases in the diversity or amount of fish species? Mm -hmm. Well, Thoreau's, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, Thoreau just loved Walden Pond, and he made all kinds of observations, but the most systematic observations that he made were on when the ice melted on Walden Pond in the spring. And he wrote the fact that, that, that the pond was a very good kind of general thermometer that kind of summarized the whole average temperature because Walden Pond uh, doesn't have any stream coming into it or stream leaving it. So it's really a very stationary body which is not affected by anything other than the general temperature of the surrounding area. And so his observations that he made in Walden Pond showed that Walden Pond melted um, anywhere from the middle of March through the beginning of April. And 
So, and, and he observed that it tended to melt earlier in warm years and later in cold years. But if you go out to Concord today, uh, Concord today melts generally anywhere from the end of February through the middle of March. So it shifted by about two weeks in terms of, of when the ice melts in Walden Pond. And then in 2012, 2012 was this kind of off the charts warm year with a warm winter and a warm spring. And in that year, in 2012, Walden Pond didn't freeze until the middle of January. And then the ice melted at the end of January. So it, it, it melted at the end of January and didn't form after that. So we can see that, that Walden Pond itself is a very good thermometer of the effects of climate change. And actually Thoreau was very interesting because Thoreau would like to make up words. And he made up a word which is called a realometer. So combining the word real and thermometer to call a, something called a realometer. So a realometer is a, an instrument which measures reality. <laughs> and you could say that, that climate change is one of these subjects in American society where we need kind of a reality check. Because there are a lot of people in the United States who say they don't believe in climate change. But climate change is happening. So it's, it's really, you absolutely cannot argue with the fact that the world's temperature is getting warmer, that glaciers are melting, that uh, polar ice caps are melting, that the sea is getting warmer and more acidic. You can't argue with that. What you can argue with is whether it's people that are causing that or not. So there's some room for discussion about whether people are causing that, though even though the overwhelming majority of scientists say that it's, it is humans that are causing that, there's really no doubt that the world is getting warmer. And then what you can certainly have a very vigorous debate about is what to do about climate or about greenhouse gases and what to do about these warming temperatures, whether we should do anything or just do nothing and kind of try to adapt to the changing temperatures. But Thoreau had this term which is called a realometer. And Walden Pond, it turns out, serves as a realometer because you know, it demonstrates you know, absolutely categorically that the climate is changing in Concord and in New England because Walden Pond is melting earlier now than it was in Thoreau's time. It's a realometer. Yes? Um, so with um, like movement of species, because if invasive species is sort of becoming a problem with competing out the native species, if we're going in and moving species to um, like northward, how would that affect the native species that are already there. Okay, so this, in this field of, of assisted migration, I mean, there are people like myself who are kind of advocating moving rare and endangered species. And then there are actually lots of other people who think that this is not a good idea to do. They think that moving species is people playing God. And they're also very worried if you move species that they become invasive. But actually, this is really kind of, I think, a false argument because all the examples that people talk about of moving native, moving species and then becoming invasive, like Japanese barberry, um, or what's the crab around here, the green crab, is that the one that's really kind of invasive around here? That if you move these species, that they become invasive. But all these cases of, of species being moved and becoming invasive are species being moved from one continent to another. And that's not what people are talking about doing at all with assisted migration. They're take, talking about taking species and moving them within the same continent about 100 miles or 200 miles north of their existing range on a continent, or they're talking about moving them sort of upslope or from one kind of mountain to the next mountain. So they're talking about moving species within their existing uh, biota. So they're talking about species and just shifting them slightly north of, of where they presently are. And also if you talk about a species like the purple fringed orchid that I mentioned, or something like the Venus flytrap, these are species which have no potential to be invasive. So these are rare species which are declining. And the great danger with those species is not that the, you know, not that the purple fringed orchid will suddenly become invasive and fill all the, the fields and meadows around Bitterford, Maine. The great danger is that the, the purple fringed orchid will just die. That when you try to transplant it into a new place that it will just die out. 
So I think with all these assisted migrations, you don't want to put them into places where there are other endangered species, but you want to try to find a habitat which is suitable for them, uh, where there are no other endangered species, and try to get them established there. And the greatest danger, again, is that they will probably just die. Yes? I know that you touched on it a little bit, but I was curious, what is climate change doing? What is climate change doing to the bee populations? Are they much like the butterfly populations where they're like really reacted to temperature or what is the case with that? Yeah, so the, the, the you talk about the wild bees. So the, the wild bees also seem to be very responsive to temperature. And uh, this is actually work which is based uh, almost entirely on museum specimens. So the fact that, that when people have gone out and collected bees for museums that that a lot of the same species, people are now collecting them earlier now than they, than they had collected in the past. So bees are very responsive to temperature. And I think that for those of you who spend a lot of time outside or looking, you know, you notice that, you know, bees really respond to warming temperatures. I particularly like looking at solitary bees, which are called minor bees. They're actually very common in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery where Thoreau is buried. And you can just see that when it's warm in the spring that all these bees suddenly emerge from out of the sand and, and, are, and are really active. So bees are very responsive to temperature. Yes? So when you were talking about your bird data and how it kind of is giving more conflicting results on whether or not they're responding, have you looked at um, the different migration patterns between species? So are, could it be that species that don't go as far might be able to respond more readily to climate change as opposed to those that go all the way to South America? Okay, that's a great question. Sounds like you've almost read our papers. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so what we, found, what we find generally is that the species which are short distance migrants, so that they're overwintering in the mid-Atlantic states or in southeast United States, are the most responsive to climate change, the most responsive to warming temperatures. Um, but the birds that are coming from South America, Central America, are, are really changing the least, if, if, if at all. Because they're mostly, they're mostly starting to migrate from there in response to day length changes or to changes in, in rainfall patterns. Um, but what's, what's a very intriguing result is that we have all these different data sets from Massachusetts which show that certain birds are kind of responding to warming temperatures and others aren't. But what's very interesting about these four studies is that there's very little relationship between the four studies. So they all show that species are responding to temperature, but it's different species in different studies. So in one study, it might be a certain warbler species, in, in, like, in, like at, at Concord, maybe it's a certain warbler species which is responding to warming temperatures. But another one of our studies, say from Mount Auburn Cemetery, that warbler isn't responding, but it's another species which are responding. So we have this general pattern of species responding to warming temperatures, but species are doing different things in different places in Massachusetts, which is in part demonstrates that these data sets are very problematic. So when you actually read our articles, one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about in our articles is how difficult it is to work with historical data sets because there's often kind of incomplete observations. They don't go out in certain years. They just go, people go on vacations for a week, or there's a big rainstorm, or they've lost their data, um, or people in the past used to go out once a week, and now they go out seven days a week. So it's, it's very challenging working with these data and actually trying to get a message out of historical data, particularly with bird data. Yes? Is the, is the minimum amount of time that we would need for a, a, a data set to be able to look credibly at changes in, in climate in some sort of organism? Huh. Well, it depends on sort of, you know, I mean, I think that the, the, ideal, the ideal data set, I would say the perfect data set is one which starts around 1970 and comes up to the present time. And that's because the, the, we had the really big climate change, the big change in the climate in, in these regions basically started happening in the kind of early 1980s. So if you have something that started in 1970, you'd have a dozen years of before the climate change really started. And then leading up to the present time, we've also had a lot of weather variability during that time. So that gives you the opportunity of seeing how things have changed over time and seeing how things have changed in relationship to this climatic variation. 
But that's not always available. Um, if you just have 15 years of any kind of data, that's, that's a good number. So for those of you who've had statistics, you often know that 15 is a really good number. If you have 15 years of something or 15 years of anything, 15 is a really good number in terms of statistical tests. The other possibility is if you can find around here, maybe you can find like an old like diary where people recorded birds, say, in the 1960s or the 1950s or the 1930s, and you match that data from, say, of, say, 10 years of data from, say, 50 years ago with, and you start to make observations around here in the same way, and I would say that as long as you probably have at least two years of data, you're okay. Because if you're matching two years of present data against, say, 10 years of old data, then you can start potentially doing some statistics. It's probably better to have three or four years of data. So we've actually, uh, invo we actually have discovered a very interesting kind of main data set. Um, at the um, College of the Atlantic, they uh, had a data set that we sort of came across uh, that was um, made by a hunter in Oxbow, Maine, named Quackenbush. And so Quackenbush made these observations in Oxbow, Maine, kind of a small little hunting and fishing community near Presque Isle. And he made uh, 20 years of observations of the flowering times of trees, the leafing out, the, the flowering time of wildflowers, the leafing out of trees, and the arrival of birds at Oxbow, Maine. And so we went up there to investigate to Presque Isle, the University of Maine at Presque Isle, and then nearby Oxbow. So we went by and we looked at, at Quackenbush's house, which is still there, and we met a lot of local people and talked to them about the community. Uh, but then we started looking around Presque Isle and we found that there were actually observations that people had been making in the Presque Isle area, which were very similar to Quackenbush's observations. So in particular, uh, that there are very keen birders in the Presque Isle area who are making the exact same kinds of observations of first arrival of birds in the spring that Quackenbush was making. So that was sort of a great opportunity. So that's what you can do if you go, if you're looking around and, and you're creative. Yes? Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, I read a paper about uh, sediment uh, a paper about sediment cores in um, Walton Pond mm -hmm. and looking at paleontology. Uh, are you guys doing anything with that kind of data or not looking at the aquatic environment? Yeah, we're not, we're not looking at sort of paleontology. The thing which is actually so amazing about Concord, which is actually unbelievable about Concord, is how much stuff is going on in Concord. So Concord is this unbelievable place where, I mean, Walden Pond has been I mean, there have been innumerable PhD dissertations at Walden Pond studying the water quality and, you know, the vegetation around it, as you say, the palynology and, um, you know, the rock walls in the area. People have written PhDs about the rock walls there and the land use of Concord. Um, so Concord is the most incredibly studied environment and, uh, you know, there's the Thoreau Society every year which has like hundreds of people coming in there and a lot of them which are Concord residents who are writing books about Thoreau and, and Walden. Uh, there have been five or four separate floras done of Concord, Massachusetts. And in contrast, probably like Biddeford, I'll guess, you know, maybe there's no flora of Biddeford or maybe one flora of Biddeford. And Concord has had four floras done of it, which is astonishing. Uh, when they have birding days, like the Christmas bird counts um, in Concord, they actually have several hundred people show up to record the birds of Concord, Massachusetts and their abundance. You know, most other places in Massachusetts, people are lucky to have like five or ten people doing the bird count, and then they have hundreds of people show up. It's a very unusual place. Okay, anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Good luck. <laughs>